Amen. My heart has been blessed already by the music this morning. Thank the Lord for music and the words that are represented today. I want you to find your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as you're turning. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Of course, it is a joy once again to be here this morning. And I trust that you've had a great week this past week as you've celebrated and given thanks to all that God has done in your life. And I trust that it's been a, a great time with your family. We look forward to the upcoming month of December and all that God has in store for this church. And I and, uh, love this time of year and all that uh, it entails. And I'm looking forward to this Christmas season. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 9. And we'll get right into the message and the word of God this morning. Beginning in verse number 9, the Bible says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We live in a world today that has come to expect instant results. Our lives are made up of instant ready meals instant coffee, instant weight loss, and instant success. We want instantaneous connectivity with faster internet speeds and faster computers and smarter electronic devices and smart home technology. We have food delivery apps, Instacart grocery delivery, cashless digital pay, and of course, who can forget Amazon and all the simple ways to shop online, especially this time of year. We are literally spoiled with the, all the technology that allows us to have things in a moment's notice, instantly at our fingertips. We want something now, and we can readily have at it. And this is a good thing, because we live in a fast-paced society, do we not? We are busy people. We have places to be, things to do, meetings to attend, jobs to report to, and families to take care of. And because of this, we don't want things to slow us down, do we? to waste our time. We absolutely hate, and I mean despise, waiting in line. For instance, the grocery store, the gas, waiting in line for getting gas, the bank or the post office or stoplights or traffic, and my all-time favorite, the DMV. Lord help us. We want things now. We want to get things done now. Now, now, now has permeated our lives. When constructing a building, however, unfortunately, there is no such thing as an instant right now building. If, you're, if you know a thing or two about building, it takes some time to build a structure that will stand the test of time. There is a process that you must follow, and it takes hard work, time, and patience. The same is true of our spiritual life. It will take diligence and time and patience to build up some qualities in our life that will last in light of eternity. It is God's desire for our lives and every Christian here this morning to build up some areas spiritually that will count and last for eternity. You see, that is the only thing that really matters. A life that is well built for Christ. A life centered in Him. Here in our text, Paul instructs this church and reminds us that we, as believers, are in fact God's building. He also likens our life to a building. He then goes on to mention where our focus should be in building our life for the Lord. So this morning, may I ask each one of you here today, what kind of life are you building for Christ? What actually are the areas we should be building in our lives right now? And is it really possible to build our life in such a way that will make an eternal difference? Today, we will examine through the vital elements to our personal life from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that explain to us 
the building process and what it's all about. We see in, in this passage a message from Paul to the church at Corinth. The title of my message very simply today is A Life Worth Building. Before we get into the message, I'd ask God to bless as we enter into his word this morning. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've allowed us to be in your house. And today we come simply to hear from you in our lives that, Lord, you would instruct us and teach us. And, Lord, I pray that today that as we look into your word that you would challenge us, that you would convict us, but most of all, Lord, that you would change us for your honor and glory. I pray that it, every person that has come today, that they would be ready to receive exactly what it is you have for them today. Lord, we count it a privilege to be in your house, and I pray that you bless the remainder of this message in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first thing we notice in our passage is the foundation of our building. Look with me at verse 10 and verse 11. Paul says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every one take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We see here in verse 10, first of all, that Paul was saying that when he came to Corinth, that he had laid the foundation. He had laid the foundation by simply preaching the truth of God's word. And he was used to bring the first members into the local church there in Corinth. And the best example I can give for each one of us this morning to explain this and what Paul was talking about is to relate this to many of the missionaries that we support on a monthly basis here at this church. Because many missionaries have had this privilege, the same privilege that Paul had here in the book of Corinth. Missionaries often go into a country or a city where the name of Christ has never been heard, and there they begin to lay the foundation to establish a true biblical church. And in the same way, the foundation of the church in Corinth was laid when Paul first went there to labor. He then goes on to say that others will come after him that will build upon the same foundation. But he says to take heed how they build it thereupon. Paul says, you don't need to lay another foundation. I've already laid the foundation. And I understand a church like Maranatha, the foundation has been laid. And thank the Lord that we have a foundation in this church. And the foundation that we will talk about today is exactly what we need. So Paul is, is writing to this Corinthian church and he says, Take heed how those that come after would build thereupon. Paul was pointing out that whoever would come and continue to build after him, that it be based in the truth of God's word. Then in verse 11, he reminds us that the only true foundation that we can build upon, the only true foundation that our life can be rested upon and our, and our beliefs uh, set firm upon is on Jesus Christ. Matthew 16 and verse 18 tells us, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This rock was not Peter, but this rock is Jesus Christ. The foundation of our building is none other than Jesus Christ alone. You see, when a church is built on a pastor, it will eventually fail. When a church is built on some special teaching or new method or new program, it will eventually fail. When a church is built on feelings or on the whims and ways of man, it will fail. The foundation of this church and any church must always be Jesus and Jesus alone. The foundation of the church is important because no building can be larger or stronger than its foundation. And if the foundation and focus of the church is bitterness or gossip or anger or division or hurt feelings, then the building of the church is going to suffer. You see, if you know anything about building, then you understand that everything starts with a good foundation. It's impossible to build something that's going to be strong and last through harsh times without the proper foundation. A good foundation is not something that is just thrown together with little thought of the preparation involved and to make sure that there's a solid starting point. If you've lived in Arizona for any amount of time, maybe some of you and many of you were here during the housing boom of 2005 and 2006. 
You look back on that time, you remember that much, like even like right now, there was a, a housing shortage in our valley, and there was a huge demand for houses. But in 05 and 06, the housing surge actually was a disaster for many homeowners. You see, some home builders were rushing and cutting corners to get houses up so quickly and to complete the project so, compl so quickly that they failed to get the foundation right. Because the soil wasn't prepared properly and the work was completed without the necessary steps needed, some houses actually began to sink and to crumble in certain areas. Beautiful brand new homes were being destroyed from the inside out because of a wrong foundation. And some people in our valley are even dealing with the effects of that even now with foundation cracks and, and cracks in the walls and, and problems with their, with their roof because of a wrong foundation. We can relate to that this morning. We can, we can think of that this morning. But the Bible speaks of this as well in Matthew chapter 7. Would you find your way there to Matthew chapter 7? For the Bible talks of this about laying a foundation and what our foundation should be rested upon. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 24. The Bible says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Being in church all my life, I look back and remember singing in Sunday school, the wise man built his house upon the rock, but the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And just a young boy in Sunday school, I can remember, I always loved that song because when it came to the part about the foolish man built his house upon the sand, there was that part in the song where it says, and the house went splat. <laughs> we see the wise and foolish builder. We notice the wise builder digs deep. The wise builder lays his foundation on the rock. His life is built on Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that when the storms of life come to this building, that it will stand because it is built on the unchanging, solid foundation of the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. But we see the foolish builder is building a life upon a sandy foundation, a loose foundation, an empty foundation, one that will not last. And I believe there are many today that are building on sinking sand. There are many well-intended, good people today that feel that they're building a solid life on things such as a life's career or a sport or a hobby or an education, but maybe have never established a true foundation for their life. Oh, sure, they may go to church from time to time, but never accepted Christ and his work on the cross for their salvation. May I say today, if that's you, and you're living a life without the true foundation found only in Jesus Christ, that Christ wants to change that for you. Just as, just as you can't build a house without first having a strong foundation, you also can't build a life for God until you first know him. Until you first met his son Jesus and accepted his work and, and received him into your life as your Lord and Savior. So do you have that foundation in Jesus Christ today? Is he your rock? Or have you been trying to build your life on the shifting sand? The shifting sand that the world promises to bring satisfaction and peace to your life, only to discover that it's empty. We like to sing a song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. If you've not experienced that all-sufficient hope today in your life, if you've not experienced the person and work of Jesus Christ in your life, he offers that personally to you today. Psalms 127 and verse 1 states, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You see, if you're trying to build a life in your own power and in your own strength, it is useless. If you're trying to serve Christ apart from a total reliance on him, you are on shaky ground this morning. Paul reminds us that our building starts with a true foundation. 
And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Many, not, if not all, today can say with 100% confidence that, yes, Jesus is my foundation. My life is settled. My foundation is strong because I've accepted Jesus as the only true foundation and giver of salvation for my life. So for most of us this morning, if not all, we have this foundation settled. We have this foundation established. This leads us to the next verse where we see the framework of our building. Paul says, now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. We already know that we have the proper foundation today. We know that. Now it's time to start building on that foundation. And imagine this morning spending $90,000 to ensure that you had a good foundation and then use cardboard and scrap wood and tin to build the rest of the building. The same goes for our spiritual building. We have a perfect foundation in Jesus Christ. And we must build wisely today. The materials that make up the structure of our building and the materials that make up the structure of our life make a huge difference to God. May I point out in this chapter, verses 1 through 3, if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, Paul once again is admonishing the church at Corinth and he begins this chapter in verse number 1 and he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Paul is pointing out that the Corinthian believers were acting like little children. They were carnal, and it failed to grow spiritually. And Paul wanted to show them the deeper spiritual blessings in life, but we find that they lacked maturity. They were actually building lives according to the flesh, the Bible says. So in verse number 12, Paul is reminding this church at Corinth, as well as you and I this morning, what kind of life we should be building, and he even describes the materials to use. And he divides the materials into two categories. First, he points out the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. These rep represent materials that will last. These are materials that are costly and valuable, not easily attained. They signify that which is of God, that which is for God, and that which has eternal value. Perhaps some qualities that could represent gold, silver, and precious stones for the Christian could possibly be our love for Christ or our love for his church, or serving the Lord, or sacrificing for Christ, or seeking God continually, knowing and doing his work, giving the gospel to a lost world, showing others the love of Christ, living and practicing God's presence daily. These are areas in our life that will last. These are just a few of the many things that will last and display value for all of eternity. And and. Paul is admonishing this church and he's reminding us this morning that our life must be built upon the things that will last, things that have eternal value, things that make a difference in light of eternity. And may our lives always reflect the things that are heaven-minded, eternally minded. Paul points out, secondly, wood, hay, and stubble. You see, these are materials that are easier to attain, they have little value in respect of eternity, and they will not last. These materials are associated with this life and what we tend to look for in this life and what we tend to work towards, but in the end are only temporal. Wood, hay, and stubble in our life could be such things as our nice cars, our houses, our nice clothes, or our new boat, or a new RV our sports teams, or our career. Yes, it could even represent our money. And maybe this is not something that you use very often, 
But I have some, some bills here this morning, and this represents paper, money, not something we use very often. And uh, I just found this outside the church this morning, so if you lost it, uh, <laughs> let me know. Not really, but our money, this piece of paper that we work for, may I remind you that one day it's going to burn up. It's only temporal. It's only something that is going to last a short time. It could be characterized as wood, hay, and stubble in our life. And there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having a nice car. There's nothing wrong with having a beautiful home. And yes, many, many, many of you in here are very proud of your RV. And you've used it often, and that's great. Every one of these things are good things in the rightful place. But our lives should never be so focused on building a life for these areas that we lose sight of what will really last and make a difference for our Lord's kingdom. So let me ask you this morning, how's your building right now? Have you been building that which is only temporal, that which will eventually be destroyed and fade away, or are you building up treasures in heaven that will last forever? It is possible to make your life count for Christ, but we must be focused on the things that really matter. And Paul reminds us this morning to build our life on the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. We not only see the foundation of our building and the framework of our building, but the Bible reminds us of the fire of our building. Verse 13 through 15, once again. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall su suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Paul says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What was Paul talking about? What was Paul reminding us of this morning when he says every work will be made manifest? If you find your way over just one book to the book of Romans, I'd like to turn your attention to Romans chapter 14, where the Bible gives in greater detail what Paul was talking about. So please allow me to expound on what Paul was referring to. And in Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse number 10, the Bible says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. These verses this morning tell us that the day will come when we will find out what kind of life we have built we will discover what we have really built for the Lord. This is called the judgment seat of Christ. Here, as Christians, we will all be examined before Christ of what kind of life we live for him. And this judgment is only for Christians, and it will reveal the believer's service for the Lord. It may I remind you this judgment is not for punishment, but to reveal, or as the Bible says, to manifest our service for either reward or loss of reward. The Bible says our works shall be revealed by fire. That which is wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up. It's only the gold and silver and precious stones of our life that will be rewarded and made known. Any believer that has built their life on the temporal things of this world will suffer loss, the Bible says. They will lose the rewards being given. They won't lose their salvation. The Bible is very clear about that. But they will miss out on the crowns of that time. All that has been done for God's glory will be manifested. It will be made known. But God not only will judge our works, but also the motives behind those works. Look at with me at verse 13 once again. Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, 
And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Of what sort it is. I challenge you today to consider this one little word, sort. It's not a word we use very often. Not a word that we're too familiar with. But the Bible is saying to judge your works of what sort it is, not how many works you have done. See, there, must, there might be much that we have done. There might be many works that we have done that amount to very little in that day. A great amount of what we call Christian work, in fact, may only be the energy of our flesh, the working of what we can manufacture, and if it's not done for the glory of God, then it won't be worth anything in that day. This is what Paul is saying. It's the character of our work that counts, the motives of our service. And I believe it's good to ask yourself the question oftentimes, what motivates me for serving Christ? Who am I trying to please? Am I doing this for God's glory or do I have another reason? The truth is today that none of us can look around at each other and I can't look around this morning, you can't either, and tell how much about a person's work for Christ simply by what you see. You can't really tell what the motive is of why we are doing what we are doing. But God does. The Bible says that God looks not on the outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. However, in that day, every motive, every work, and every self-glorified motive will be judged. The judgment seat of Christ should be one of the greatest motivators, I believe, for any true believer of Christ. It should motivate each one of us to be closer to the Lord than we've ever been, to be busy for the Lord and to be faithful till he returns, but also to realize that everything we do must be for the honor and glory of God and not our own glory. Let's suppose that in that day I have nothing to glorify the Lord with. Uh, yes, I've trusted him as my Savior, maybe, but my life seemingly amounted to nothing. If any man's work shall be, may be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire, the Bible says. You see, you may have built a beautiful home. You spent a long time building it, but one day it takes fire. And you're awakened in the middle of the night to find the flames roaring through the halls. You leap out of one of the windows and you're saved, but the house is burned up. That is the way it will be for many Christians. Their life will go for nothing. Their life and testimony will be wasted. There will be no reward, but the individual believer will, will be saved, yet so as by fire. I'm reminded of Lot. He spent his life in Sodom, building in vain. When God finally destroyed the city by fire, Lot was saved, but everything he had lived for was burned up. How sad it would be that when the Lord takes account of our life, that we stand there empty-handed. So let me ask you today, what will you have to show for this life after the revealing fire? Will you have no crowns to give back to Jesus? Will you look back in disappointment and wish you had done more? 1 John in verse 2 and verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Oh, I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to look back and regret my life that has been lived for Christ, that I lived it for myself. Every one of us here this morning is investing our life in something. You see, you cannot live, really, without making an investment in something. The question this morning is not if you're making an investment, but what are you making an investment in? Will that investment be permanent? Will it abide Will it stand the test? Will it make it through the fire? In closing, let me ask each one of us this morning, do you have a sure foundation? Have you trusted Christ for your eternal life and forgiveness of sins? If not, today would be a great day to do that, to get that settled in your life. What about maybe the Christians that are here today? How's your building today? How's your life what are you focused on today? Are you building on things that will last? You see, it's never too late to start building on some things in our life that will last in light of eternity. 
And today would be a great day to make that decision as well. And last of all, will you be ready to give an account of your life before God? Or will you be ashamed at his coming? I want to challenge each one of us this morning to think about the words of Paul and to make a decision for our life that would benefit eternity because of what our life is made up of. Let's go to the Lord as we close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word and Lord, I